Well, turn with me to John chapter 11. We're continuing to look at the seven I am statements of Jesus. And as I've mentioned in these statements, Jesus is telling us something about himself. And the more we know about him, the more you know, we trust him. You know, and Jesus tells us these things, things that could only be true if he were the Messiah, if he were God. And of course, we know that he is. Now, just a quick review of those seven statements. The seven statements are, I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the gate or door to the sheepfold, the good shepherd, the resurrection in the life, the way, the truth, and life, and the true vine. And so this evening we come to number five. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Now, this is a long story. It's got a lot of verses, so we better get started. And it's, it begins with Jesus receiving a message from Mary and Martha. Their brother Lazarus is sick, and so they send word to Jesus. Verse 1, John 11, verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and, his, and her sister Martha, this Mary, who, <clears throat> whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now they send word to Jesus. Sending word was a demonstration in itself of their faith and trust in Jesus. Now, he'd been sick before, surely he'd been sick, but this time it was different. This time they were having difficulty dealing with it. Something was different. It was beyond their abilities to handle, but they knew who could handle it. Jesus. And so they sent a message to him, letting him know of Lazarus' condition. And, and isn't that what we're told to do? You know, if we have a problem, if we have a need, if we have a sickness, we're to take it to God. James tells us, James chapter 5, beginning with verse 13. He says, he asks, is anyone among you in trouble? Let him pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, this incident happened before James wrote his epistle, but they're still following the instructions that are given. They're following the instructions that the Bible tells us. And what was the result of this act of faith? <laughs> well, verse 4, when Jesus heard this, he, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. So John confirms what he's already said, that Jesus loved Lazarus and his two sisters. They, they were important to him. But you wouldn't know it by his reaction. He's told, There's, Lazarus is sick, we need you to come and help. And what does Jesus do? Nothing. He, he doesn't do anything. He, he stays where he is. You know, Jesus seemed content to allow Lazarus to die. Now, we know what the end of the story is. But doesn't it still seem a little callous that he wouldn't do something? And, and that in itself should teach us a lesson. Teach, teach us a lesson. You know, there's no way for us to understand everything that God does. It doesn't make sense. Everything that God does doesn't make sense. 
You know, and if we expect to know, expect it to make sense, if we ex expect God to explain everything to us, right, we're going to be disappointed. Now, again, we know the end of the story. We know Lazarus is going to die. Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But it's still difficult to understand why Jesus would allow Mary and Martha to go through this headache. What we do know, what we, what we believe, what we can trust is that Jesus had a good reason for it. And he gives the reason. He says, so that God will be glorified. You know, so that his son would be glorified. And Jesus had a reason that was greater than the grief. You'll remember what, I, what God said through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9. He said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's ways, his thoughts are, are higher than ours. We're not going to understand, but what we can do is trust. We can trust that God knows that God will always do what is right, what is best. You know, we trust even as Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And so no matter what problems we face, we know that God is in control. He knows what's happening, and we trust that he has a plan. So it wasn't until after Lazarus had died that Jesus decided to travel to Bethany. You know, the village where these three siblings lived. Uh, the disciples didn't understand it, though. Uh, Jesus said he didn't want to go, now he wants to go. Plus, they had been in the region earlier and had left uh, because of the threat of danger. And Thomas points this out, verse 8. But Rabbi... They said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Now, when did the Jews try to stone Jesus? Well, actually, they tried to stone him twice. The first is found in John chapter 8. We mentioned that just a few weeks ago. It occurred after, after Jesus had said that Abraham had seen him and rejoiced. If you turn back to John chapter 8, the religious leaders didn't understand Jesus when he said that Abraham had seen him. I mean, how could Abraham had seen Jesus? Abraham had died hundreds of years earlier, a thousand years earlier. John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. So they understand when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, Jesus is comparing himself to God. That's blasphemy. And the Old Testament law said the way, what to do with blasphemers was to stone them. So they start picking up stones. So that was the first instance of them trying to stone Jesus. The second happened during the festival of dedication in John chapter 10. The feast of uh, festival of dedication, better known as, as Hanukkah. Jesus was again in Jerusalem. And the religious leaders surround Jesus and they ask him, you know, when are you just going to plainly tell us whether or not you're the, the Messiah? And Jesus said he had told them. Plus he had had all the miracles. Yeah, they just didn't believe. And then he said in verse 30, so John ch chapter 10, beginning with verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Again, the Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. He's, he's comparing himself to God. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are stone, not stoning you for any good works, they replied, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claimed to be God. And so after this second attempt to stone him, Jesus had taken the disciples away from Jerusalem to the other side of the Jordan, and it appears he took them there for safety, right, for himself and, and for them as well. 
And now Jesus doesn't seem too concerned because he wants to go back. So back in John chapter 11, verse 9, Jesus answered, Are not there 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see by the world's light. It's when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. You know, Jesus knew that he wouldn't be killed before it was time. God had a plan. God had a mission for Jesus. Jesus was going to fulfill this mission as long as he was fulfilling God's mission. As long as he was doing what God had sent him to do, he was walking in the light, there wouldn't be any problem. He's not going to stumble. They're not going to attack him. God is going to protect him until it's time for his crucifixion. Verse 11. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe but let us go to him. Now, Jesus is a little cryptic at first. He doesn't say he's dead. He's, he's sleeping. <laughs> but he meant death. Right? That's what he meant. And when they didn't understand it, he just comes out and tells them, uh, Lazarus has died. But what's more, he almost seems glad. Right? At least glad that he wasn't there. Now, why? Well, because Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew what the result was going to be. There was something greater in store for Lazarus, for Mary, for Martha, and the disciples. Again, knowing the, the end of the story, you know, what could have had a greater impact? What action could Jesus have taken differently than he took that would have a greater impact than what he did? I mean, Jesus could have gone. When he received word, he could have healed Lazarus. For that matter, he could have healed Lazarus without going anywhere. Well, we've already seen that with the centurion servant. Right? Don't, you don't need to come to my house. You just say the word and he'll be healed. Jesus could have healed him. Could have healed Lazarus the, the moment he heard. But he didn't. You know, sometimes we want God to do something in our lives and we're disappointed when he doesn't. But perhaps God has something bigger. Something that we can't see and maybe, maybe we won't even understand. You know, the main reason for God acting isn't just for our comfort, but it's for his glory. How can God be glorified? And that's what Jesus said at the beginning, right? You know, I'm glad I wasn't there this is for God's glory. Verse 16, then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, Didymus means twin, and so Thomas undoubtedly had a, a twin. Thomas, uh, today, Thomas is known as the doubter, right? Thomas the doubter. Uh, the disciples see Jesus, but Thomas wasn't there. And when they tell him, oh, we saw Jesus, he's alive, he says, yeah, I'm, I don't believe you. <laughs> unless I see Jesus for myself, unless I can put my, my hands, touch his, his hands, his, his side, yeah, I'm not going to believe. And so he's known as the doubter. But here, here we see Thomas making a commitment that the rest weren't willing to make. Yeah, uh, this is where Jesus is going. I'm going with him, even if it means death. I'm certain it will, but I'm going with him. There's a commitment. Now, before we continue with the story, I, I want to make a, a few observations. First, first, notice that Jesus was not in a hurry. Jesus wasn't rushing anywhere. Now, what would you have done if you had heard that a friend was sick? If you knew you could help? and they needed your immediate attention, what would you do? You'd go as quickly as you could. You know, I, I want to be there as fast as I can. 
to be by your friend's side, your family member's side. But, but that's not what Jesus did. Jesus took his time. Why? Well, because he was never in a hurry. Jesus was always calm. He was calm because he knew who was in control. He didn't have to worry. He knew that God had the situation in hand. You know, it's the kind of disposition that Paul wrote about to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, when he wrote, do not be anxious about anything. Well, how can we not be anxious about anything? Well, Paul continues, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, pre present your requests to God. You know, knowing, knowing that God was in control gave Jesus a peace and a calm assurance. Peace and assurance that we need today. And so Jesus didn't hurry off. He wasn't frazzled, right, when he heard about this. He was calm. Second. Jesus is led by his father and not by his emotions. Now, too often we allow our emotions to dictate our actions. Jesus, Jesus certainly had emotions about the situation. Uh, we're told twice about Jesus' love for, for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. You know, don't you know that he understood what Mary and Martha were going through? Their concern for their brother when he was sick and their grief when he died. He understood what they were going through. And still he stayed. You know, he didn't allow those emotions to cloud his judgment. He waited until God said it was time to go. Until God led him to go. Instead of, you know, he followed the leading of his father. You know, we're told that and during his ministry, Jesus only did what the Father told him to do. He only said what the Father told him to stay, to, to say. You know, and it's a lesson that, that we still need to learn. Third, third, we need to learn that God is always right on time. I'm not sure Mary and Martha thought that, that uh, Jesus was on time. You, you listen to what they say in a few verses and, and you wonder... But God doesn't work on our timetable. He works on his timetable, and he's always right. And therefore, who needs to change their schedule? Yeah, you know, we do. We need to change our schedule uh, to fit his. All right, so after delaying two days for a trip, Jesus and his disciples finally arrive in Bethany. Verse 17, John 11, picking up with verse 17, says, On his arrival... Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. All right, so Jesus already knew he had already told the disciples Lazarus has died, but now it's been confirmed, right? Now he's been told, yep, he has died. Verse 21, Lord Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, you're late. If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. What would you have said to Jesus? If you'd been Martha. You know, when they sent for Jesus, their brother Lazarus was still alive. Now, several days later, when he finally gets there, Lazarus has been dead for four days. You know, it would be easy to get upset. Yet Mary didn't even come out to greet him. Wonder why. You know, they had to wonder. What took him so long? If Jesus had only come sooner, Lazarus would still be alive. And Martha may have been upset with Jesus, may have been a little curt in her comments, but Jesus doesn't reprimand, reprimand her. 
Verse 23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And Martha thinks Jesus is talking about a day far off in the future. Long way off. But a day off in the future is not helping right now. She's hurting now. She knows one day the faithful will rise again, but, but what happens today? Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who, was, who is to come into the world. Right, so here we have the I am statement. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And we'll get back to this in, in just a few minutes. Jesus is asking Martha about her faith in him. Do you, do you believe? Do you trust me? And she does. She makes the same confession that Peter did. You know, when, you remember when Peter or Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. This is exactly what Martha says here. She's demonstrating her faith that Jesus is the Messiah. Verse 28, after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her, Noticed how quickly she got up and went out. They followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. She makes the same comment that her sister had made. If you'd only gotten here sooner. If you hadn't been late, my brother would be alive. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could he, he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Now, verse 35 is often referred to as the shortest book in the Bible. Well, yes and no. <laughs> it's the shortest book in the English Bible, right? In English translations, uh, but not in the Greek. Uh, in English, it's only two words and nine letters, but in the Greek, in, uh, it's, uh, it's 16 letters. In the Greek, the shortest is 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice always, which is two letters shorter. So anybody ever ask you a trivia question, the shortest verse in the Bible, it's what? 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice always. Jesus wept. Why did Jesus cry? Uh, there have been several suggestions. One suggestion was because he knew that Lazarus had experienced paradise and now he was taking him away from it. That'd be hard, wouldn't it? I, I remember hearing the story of one man who, who had done just that. He, he had had a near-death experience, uh, had been said that he was dead, uh, he had visions of heaven, heaven, and came back to life, and and he was distraught. <laughs> he had a hard time; was depressed for a long, long time. And so maybe that was it. Others have said that it was because so few people had placed their faith in Jesus. 
that he was weeping. They, they didn't trust him. You know, even Mary and Martha seem to have had some, some doubts at this point. But I think the best explanation is that he did feel sorry for Mary and Martha. Now, Jesus understood what they were going through. He understood the depth of their loss. He knew it was going to get better, but they were still having to go through this. Verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord said Martha, the sister of the dead man. By this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So Lazarus is laid in a tomb, much like Jesus would be, you know, after his crucifixion, with a stone across the entrance. Now, Jesus was laid in a tomb. We're told no one had been, been buried there, but, but most tombs uh, were large enough for, for several bodies, and, and maybe there were other bodies in this tomb as well. Jesus asked the stone be moved away, and, and Martha's concerned because of how long her brother had been dead. She's concerned because she still doesn't understand what Jesus is going to do. And he repeats it, but she still doesn't understand. Verse 41, so they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus. Come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Augustine once remarked that if Jesus hadn't been specific, right, and calling Lazarus by name, maybe other dead people would have risen too. I don't know if that's true, but. But it sounds good. Uh, Lazarus did come back to life and he's, he's trying to walk out of the tomb, but he's still wrapped up in his grave clothes. That would have been, would have been fun. Mary and Martha were excited. They're, they've got their brother back. But not everyone was excited. In the next chapter, we find out that the Jewish leaders were going to try to kill Lazarus. I mean... Think how quickly this story would spread. Uh, think. And we're told people started putting their faith. More people started putting their faith in Jesus because of this. This miracle. And so the religious leaders are already trying to, planning to kill Jesus. They just add Lazarus to the list. But we have no record of them carrying out that, that plan. Now, it probably could go unsaid, but I think we do need to say it. Lazarus eventually died again, right? He, he didn't live forever. He, he rose from the dead, but he's still not, he's not still alive today. So, so the, the resurrection was only temporary, but Jesus is showing that he had power over death. He is also the power over life. You know, our lives don't end at the tomb because Jesus is the resurrection in the life. And so we don't need to be discouraged or, or lose heart. Here, here are three quick lessons I think we need to learn from this or can learn from this. First, first, death is a transition. It's a transition from this life to the next. D.L. Moody once commented, he said, someday you will read in the papers that D.L. Moody of East Northfield is dead. Don't believe, don't you believe a word of it. At that moment, I shall be more alive than I am now. I shall have gone up higher. That is all. Out of this old clay tenement into a house that is immortal. 
A body that death cannot touch, that sin cannot taint, a body fashioned like unto his glorious body. Death is a transition. Billy Graham made a similar statement before he died. He said, someday you'll hear that Billy Graham has died. Don't believe it. That day I'll be more alive than ever. I've just changed addresses. I have gone into the presence of God. And Helen Keller noted, death is no more than passing from one room into the other. But there's a difference for me, you know. Because in that other room, I shall be able to see and hear. Death, it's only a transition. Second, we are not alone when we die. I know you've heard stories. I heard stories that came out in in 2020, height of COVID. People in, in hospitals, nursing homes dying, and they wouldn't let family come and visit. And so they died with no family there. Family not being able to say goodbye. But they did not die alone. Because I've also seen and I've heard so many stories of those who are dying, seeing angels. And so I don't believe they died alone. In Luke chapter 16, the parable of the rich man in Lazarus, Jesus talks about Lazarus dying and angels coming to transport him, to to escort him to paradise. And so the Bible tells us that angels are sent to assist us in this transition from this life to the next. And so we know that no one dies alone. Jehovah's Witnesses tell us that we go to sleep when we die. You know, you just go to sleep. You don't know you're in the ground. Time will pass quickly. Like when you're asleep, right, at night. But Paul wrote that when we die, we immediately leave our earthly earthly bodies and we are with God. Three, in death, there is a reunion with our loved ones who have died in Christ. I believe that Bible teaches that we will recognize those who have gone before us. You remember the story James, Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah appear there with Jesus and they immediately recognize Moses and Elijah. They'd never met them. They died years before and yet they, they knew who they were. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, at first they didn't recognize him, but that's because they weren't looking for him. But once they knew it was him, they didn't have any problem spotting him, any problem identifying him. In John 21, when Jesus appeared on the seashore, Peter recognized him, jumped into the water, swam as fast as he could to the beach to be near him. You know, we grieve when when loved ones die, but we do not grieve as the world does because we know we will see them again. And then fourth, death is not the end. Death is only the beginning. Jesus said, John 14, verse 19, before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. Because he lives, because of his resurrection from the dead, we know that we will be raised from the dead. And that's why Jesus said he is the resurrection and the life and that those who believe in him will live. Jesus was talking about our eternal souls that go on forever. And it's an important truth that we need to remember. We have an an eternal soul that will go on. You know, the, the question is where? Because our souls will either go to heaven with God or, in, or dwell forever in hell apart from him. And so we need to know where. Dr. Kenneth Meyer told a story about flying into Chicago, making a trip. And he says, as the plane uh, was beginning to land, descending, they crossed over the interstate. And Meyer noticed that this huge traffic jam 
Cars were lined up. They were just stopped. In fact, he said people were getting out of their cars, looking ahead, right, trying to get on tiptoes, look to see if they could figure out what the problem was. But it was too far ahead. They couldn't see what was causing the traffic jam. All they knew is they weren't moving and they weren't happy. But he said as the, the plane continued, he got to see what was up ahead and he could see flashing lights. And so they were already taking care of the problem. The people didn't even know what the problem was, but Meyer said he could see that it wouldn't be very long before they had cleared the interstate and they could start moving again. He landed, he got to his car, and as he headed toward the interstate where this problem was, he knew it wasn't going to be a problem very long. He had a different perspective. Right? He could see what they couldn't. He could see on up ahead. Perspective makes all the difference. Nobody likes a traffic jam. But if we could look down and, you know, and give a heavenly view of what's going on, we might have a different view. We had a different perspective. By declaring that he is the resurrection and the life, Jesus gives us a different perspective of death of dying because we know that he rose from the dead that we too will live with him forever let's pray lord we thank you we thank you for for jesus that he not only died for our sins but rose from the dead we thank you for this this promise that we have this hope that we have that we one day will be with you and with all of those who have gone before us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.